Again, thank you for coming to the session this afternoon. I have spent time working on ways to make pro forma analysis more accessible for planners because it is something that I consider to be very important in the planning process, at least just to understand how the, the, the process, the pro forma analysis works. I've developed and teach a course at Ryerson on pro forma analysis for planners, and that's been going on for a while now, and it progressively improves over time. I've also started offering workshops to planners through the OPPI and the Urban Land Institute and through individual municipalities. And again, it just seems to be that there is a desire for planners to at least understand how the pro forma process works. So today what I'm going to do is basically try to help the, demystify the, the pro forma process, help understand what the key concepts are, um, and also maybe at some point motivate you to undertake a pro forma on your own if you feel confident enough. So I'm going to go through a basic pro forma structure. There are going to, there's going to be numbers. Sorry, you know, that's the only way I can do, I can do it. Um, I'm going to talk about ways to assess the performance. How well does a project look like it's going to do? Talk about risk and uncertainty, because those are important concepts for developers. Developers talk about that a lot, and I'll get into that more. And then tie this into resilience, since that's the theme of the conference, just to give you a sense of how pro formas can be applied to get a better understanding of how resilient measures might be assessed. So essentially, what's a pro forma? A pro forma is a model that's developed to assess the viability of a proposed project. Okay? It does, you need to, it, it's based on putting together essentially um, a spreadsheet that uses assumptions, and it's really important to have the proper assumptions and also incorporating the planning, the, the appropriate planning context. Um, but it is, it's something that really is put together as a means to evaluate the long-term viability of an investment proposal. So let's talk about the different perspectives, why are, why are performers used? Developers use performance extensively. They use it because they want to evaluate the risk associated with an investment. Talk to developers, and anybody investing private funds into a, any type of a project, their major concern is what is the risk involved. They want to be able to assess the risk, and that's what a pro forma helps to do. It also allows the, an approach that gives you an basically gives you an opportunity to look at opportunity costs, because when we look at a particular investment, it isn't evaluated in isolation. When a developer is looking at a project, they're comparing it to other opportunities. If I don't invest here, because it's not appropriate, maybe I can invest in something else that will earn me a certain return. It's also used for financing. Developers use a pro forma as a means to raise money to finance their projects. So they have to demonstrate that the proposal that they're, they want to pursue has financial feasibility. If not, then the lender won't be interested in lending the money. And one thing that I always talk to planners about is it's, a, it's about assessing wealth generation. Developers want to make money. Right? And they want to figure out how much money they're going to make based on their return rates. And this is something I know when I get into discussions with planners, they don't want to talk about the fact that developers want to make money. I mean, as a source of you know, some consternation. But yes, I mean, that's why they're doing it. There's, there are great developers out there who are really interested in, you know, building and city building and investing their dollars in a way that improves their, you know, the, the context, but they, they want to make money. And so, so lenders' perspective, lenders use, as I mentioned, they use a pro forma because they want to evaluate how effectively a proposed development is going to generate the funds necessary to offset the debt obligations. They want to make sure that the developer can pay off the loan. And lenders are notoriously risk averse, right? Developers tend to be more in, involved in taking risk. Lenders don't want to take risks. They want to be assured that the proposed development will in fact cover their, their debts. And then there's also the planners. Why are planners, or why should planners be interested in a, in a pro forma analysis? Well, it helps to understand you know, how planning relates to the feasibility of development. Right? Just get a sense of how different proposals impact 
the viability of a proposed development. Okay. And one message I try to get across when we're doing work like this is try to keep it basic. Sometimes planners get overwhelmed when they look at a pro forma. They try to make it too complicated. It doesn't have to be very complicated. Just covering the key points allows you to understand better how a proposal is expected to perform. And also allows you also to be more conversant with developers and consultants. I find when you talk to developers and consultants, just being able, you know, if they're throwing out terms and I'm going to get into net operating income capital capitalization rate, if you at least understand what those concepts represent, it'll, it gives you, a, a, empowers you in a sense that allows you to have a more equal conversation with people involved in the development side. And I think developers also would like, you know, I think from their, their perspective, being able to explain from their point of view how certain initiatives might impact their feasibility is something that they would um, also welcome. So I'm going to get some technical terms out of the way. There are two types of investments that usually we look at. First is what's called a build and hold. That's essentially a commercial project where the developer is proposing apartment building, commercial, um, you know, retail, office, industrial, with the intention of holding on to the development after it's completed. So it's looked at as a long-term investment. Okay, and that has a different approach to it than what's the other one, which is the build and sell, which is traditionally a condo or subdivision where the developer is in, they build and they get out. So they do two different approaches to it. With the build and hold, the, the expectation is that there will be a long-term feasibility involved, analysis involved, so looking at it over a certain number of years. So to do that, there's also another differentiation I make is what's called a dynamic cash flow analysis, which essentially is looking at a proposed development over a period of time. We talk about dynamic cash flows. So it's the notion that you're looking at a development that's modeling its performance over a set period of time. And static is looking at it at one point in time. You don't, even for a long-term hold, a development that may be a commercial investment that a developer is going to hold on to, you may want to look at what's called a static. At one point in time, okay, let's say I, today, how much of a return might it deliver? So that's like a quick and dirty approach, it's called usually. So, you know, again, it, there are two approaches to it, and I'll show you how they both look. And when we talk about a pro forma, it really isn't that complicated. There are only three components, three major components to it. There are the revenues. How much revenue is a development expected to generate? How much, you know, rents? How much is it going to return in terms of, you know, sales of condos even? And then there's the costs. How much does it cost to build? How much is it going to cost to operate? And the last component is assessing the, mar the project performance. So we're looking at return rates you know, to get a sense of how does the proposed development look. So let me go through some of the, the key issues that you'll have to, you know, some of the key points. When we talk about costs, there are three types of costs associated with a proposed development. First is the land cost. Of course, that's you know, how much the developer paid for the land. Market rates usually you know, apply because that's something that needs to be taken into consideration. And it, sometimes, you know, in, the, in a lot of instances, the land value or the land cost reflects the highest and best use. And that's where we get into conflicts between what might be best from a planning perspective, a city building perspective, and what developers see as in terms of maximizing their returns. So, so, but that's one component. Now, one issue I have had recently discussed with some developers is if they've held on to the, the land for a long period of time, how do they incorporate that into a feasibility analysis? And I've gotten two answers. One answer is that they don't consider the land to be a cost because it's their long-term holding, you know, they own it. But on the other side, there, the argument is, well, the opportunity cost is the developer could turn around and sell that property tomorrow at market rate. So that would be the opportunity cost involved with it. So I usually include the land cost when I do an analysis just because it's more conservative and I think, you know, it represents that opportunity cost where the land could be used in another as another means. 
There are lots of good data sources available. Na national, international, sort, CoStar, Geo Warehouse, um, Altus, um, RealNet. There are, there are sources available to find out what land values might be, and it's, one, it's a big issue. One of the major questions I get is how do we evaluate or how do we assess land cost? Then there's the hard cost, which is the bricks and mortar. How much does it cost to physically build the structure? So anything associated with the construction of a building is considered a hard cost. The materials, the labor, that's all hard cost. And there are, you know, the developers also include a contingency, which is to be conservative, the notion being that there may be some unforeseen situations arise during the construction period, so they'll include that as well. And there are sources as well for that. Um, um, there's an Altus cost guide. It's focused on major metropolitan areas across Canada. They provide range, cost ranges for different types of development. Then there's soft costs. Soft costs are all the supportive costs associated with the development. So we're looking at the professional costs. So planners, lawyers, engineers, architects, that's all part of it. And soft costs also include the municipal processing, the, the costs for different you know, fees and charges. That's also considered to be a soft cost. Soft costs for the base, for the, for, yeah, for, for moving forward in, the, in a pro forma, usually assume 30, 35, 40%, just to get a, a, a baseline as a, a number to move forward with, with. Again, as opposed to listing architect, lawyer, engineer, you don't need to do that. So a nice summary would be appropriate to move forward. There's different kinds of financing. First, there, well, there's two types of two sources of money. First, there's equity, which is the amount that the developer or the investor puts into their project. And there are business structures where the developer you're dealing with may not be the equity investor. The developer might be taking a percentage of the overall revenues as their payment for developing the project, and they go out to outside equity investors to finance the equity side. And that's where those are the ones taking on the risk. So that's something to keep in mind when you're looking at a pro forma. There's the debt, so there's loan. There's a loan involved in the project as well. Very few are self-financing, they look to outside sources. And there are two types of loans to just be aware of. There's a construction loan, which takes place during the construction period where a developer accrues interest based on what's called a draw. So they take money out as they need it during the construction phase. And when the development is done, and if it's a commercial project, that is then turned into a permanent loan. And then the project itself is responsible for paying off the, the debt. So there are two different loans to, to take into consideration. The amount of equity that's required usually depends on a discussion or a negotiation between the developer and the financing side. And it's based on something called the loan to value or loan to cost. You know, the higher the, the expectation of the investor's contribution, the more the risk involved because they're putting in a higher equity amount. I, I was looking at an office development, an example, just a hypothetical, just to get a sense of how things would look. So we're looking at a 60,000 square foot site FSI floor, floor space index of five and parking ratio of one to 1,000 square square footage, square square feet. Again, these are just assumptions. These are just numbers I'm putting up there so we can walk through the process. This, this is what you start off with. You figure out how much up front does it cost to build the project. So we have the part, you know, we figure out how much can be built. There's something called efficiency. That's how much of the development can generate revenue. Developers want to maximize that. They want to get as much revenue as they can out of the site, out of the development. And you know, 80, 85, 90% sometimes. I've heard 85% right now for residential back in the GTA in Toronto. And then you figure out the land cost, the development cost. So we have land, hard, soft. Then we have the financing. And then that gives me a sense of how much of a permanent loan I will fold over into the operation part of the project. Okay, so that's the cost side. So you need to go through and determine how much is it going to cost to build and what's the financing involved. So then we're gonna look at the revenue, the project operation. We're gonna look at the revenue side. 
and just be aware that when we're talking about operation itself, there's a revenue schedule, how much our tenants paying in rent. There's also how to deal with the, expense, the expenses of a development. And this is an issue that you should be aware of, that there are leasing arrangements between developers, landlords, and tenants where the expense for operating the common area of the building is passed through to the tenant. Right? So the operating cost is not, the risk is not entirely assumed by the developer. That is, sorry, that's passed on to the tenant. And there have to be a vacancy component incorporated into it. Any financial you know, um, concern will look for some type of a vacancy factor just to make sure that it's being realistic and conservative. Even in strong markets, it's usually important to include a vacancy um, number in there. So this is, this is some numbers here. This is a projection of the operation of our hypothetical office building. I've extended it out for 10 years. So we're looking 10 years into the future. And I have my revenues here. And as you can see here, I, we're looking into the future. These numbers escalate because we want to take into to account the cost of living or inflation as a factor. So I have rents, I have my building operation, I have effective gross income, which essentially is how much revenue the project is expected to generate after vacancy is taken into consideration. Then I have my expenses here, I have total expenses. So that includes main management, maintenance, insurance, utilities, so th those are factors that need to be incorporated in the expenses. Now, so we have an EGI, which is revenues, essentially building operating expenses. We subtract the two, and we come up with the net operating income. This is the first key factor you should keep in mind and remember. The net operating income is used as the basis for evaluating the feasibility. Uh, not, it's, it's a, at, sorry. It is a way to value the development. How much is this project worth? It's based on the net operating income. And the net operating income is used because it's the project's performance independent of debt. Before any debt considerations are taken into account, that's how much the project will generate. So it gives a pure picture of how the project is going to perform. Because debt, you should keep in mind, depends on the size of the loan, the interest rate, so that could vary quite a bit. This is more based on the development itself. So then, as I said, it's a basis project valuation. When we take debt service out after the NOI, we come up with the before tax cash flow. It's also called the cash throw off. That's how much cash the project is expected to generate after the debt is taken into consideration. So this is used, this line here, as the basis for determining the return rate or how well the project's performing. So that's our first um, projection into the future. So what we want to do is we want to take this cash flow and use it as a, as a means to evaluate how well the project is going to perform or the investment's going to perform. So we then pursue something or um, pursue, we then conduct what's called a discounted cash flow analysis. This is a way to take that cash flow and translate it into a present value, which is considered to be today. Okay. Because if you're looking at something like this, 10, 15, 20 years into the future, you have a bunch of numbers, you know, and the best, you know, it's, it's nice to be able to summarize it in single figures that allow us to evaluate the project performance. So this discounted cash flow analysis takes all those future values that are stated in those years and what's called discounts them into present values or what's that cash flow worth today. And today becomes the reference point that's used as the means for evaluating projects to other projects. Because it's easier when we look at something now, how we can, we can compare an office building to an apartment building. Or if we're looking at different variations within an office building. It's very 
you know, important to be able to look at it at a single point in time. And that point in time that's used is today. And so in the, you know, they'll call it time zero. What's it worth now? So we're talking about June 17th, 2017. What is this project worth? And it, it, the, the, the key thing to remember is that it uses a discount rate. So these cash flows are discounted. Just think about if you're looking at a compounding going forward. If I invest $1,000 in a bank at 5% in a year, it's 1,000 plus 5% interest. If I look a year from now, if I have $1,000 in a bank, what's it worth today? It's 1,000 minus that 5% discount. So we're just, it's, it's basically the reverse of compounding. We're used to thinking about compounding. What's it like going forward? Now I'm asking you to take a look at discounting, which is going backwards to today. So there are two parts to this analysis that we are going to incorporate into the evaluation. The first is how well does the project perform on an annual basis? And again, it could be quarterly, it could be monthly, but to keep it basic, we're just going to do annually. How, much, how well does this project perform on an annual basis? Because the developer is investing to receive a cash flow. Right? That's part of their intention, is to make money off the project operation. But there's another part to the analysis as well that needs to be taken into account, and that is the value of the asset. So the investor, they're, they're building the development to get the cash flow, but they're also expecting that physical asset to increase in value over time. So if we're going to do a, a proper evaluation of the project performance, we need to take into consideration what the value of that asset is. So we're not just looking at annual cash flows, we're asking, okay, in a certain number of years in the future, how much do we expect that project to be worth? Because that's something the developer will gain additional wealth from when they sell that, if they sell it. So how do we assess the project value? Okay. There, there are several ways to do it. You can, you know, there, there's building replacement, which is looking how much does it cost to physically replace the building. That would be one approach. Another approach is looking at comparables, finding, recent sales and figuring out, well, if an office building of similar quality sold for this amount, we can assign a value to it, this, our project. But the, mo the preferred approach is looking at the economic potential or the economic value of the building. So we're looking at the economic value of the building. So in, it, it, you know, so we're not, and it's based on the net operating income. And that's why I said the net operating income is so important because the NOI, if you go to buy, if you go into Calgary and you look to buy an office building, the net operating income will be listed in the sale, the, the listing of the sale, because that's a key metric that's used to evaluate the building's worth. Right? So we need to look at the NOI. And of course, NOI does take into consideration the, you know, the, the physical characteristics of the building, but we're just focusing on the NOI. And we're going to take the NOI, which is that, that measure, and translate that into a value by using a concept known as the capitalization rate. Another key term you should keep in mind and remember when we're talking about commercial developments. The cap rate is a measure of the market's strength. Right? The cap rate is the NOI, divided by the sales price. And that will give you an, a ratio or percentage that can then be used to evaluate future transactions. And there are real estate research companies that track this, right? So, so it, it's, it's, a, it's readily available. You know, there, there are companies, C.B. Richard Ellis, Cushman and Wakefield, Colliers, they put out reports that track capitalization rates. So if you wanna take a look at what the building is worth, you have to find the cap rate. Okay. So if we want to know the project value, it's the NOI divided by the cap rate. So for example, I have a building generates an income of $500,000 in NOI, and the market cap rate is 6%. Knowing nothing else about the building, all I need to know is these two things. I would 
assign a value of $8,333,333. So that would be my valuation of the project. Where the difference becomes buyer and seller is, comes into play is what's the cap rate. Right? Cap rates can go up and down based on the sense of what the market might be. And this is just from the GTA, just to show you that there's, they're, they're tracked over time. The cap rate is a lower, it's inverse to um, the market conditions in the sense that the lower the cap rate, the stronger the market, because the lower the cap rate, the higher the value of the building is in the denominator. So if you take a look there, you can see um, this is when the market, the real estate market had a bit of um, an issue in 2008, 2009, the cap rates went up. Then the market started to increase in strength or in just you know recover. And you can see in 2015, the third quarter, cap rates are very low for downtown AA office, tier one regional, and multi-residential. So we go back to our hypothetical building, our office building, and <clears throat> excuse me. I figure, okay, now I have to figure out, I know my NOIs, what is the building value that's incorporated into my calculation? Well, I take the NOI, if I, I'm assuming a, a nine year sale. Okay, I'm assuming I'm selling this building in nine years. Doesn't necessarily mean the developer will sell it. It's a way to assign a value to the asset that gets incorporated into the return rate. So if I look here, I go to the 10th year, the rule of thumb is if I'm selling in the ninth year, I go one year into the future. So the ninth year uses the 10th year NOI. So it's always the next year NOI as the basis. So I, cap, I divided the NOI by the cap rate and I come up with that, 122828 That's the, the projected sale price for that building. So that's, we have that amount now. We have to take out the amount of debt that still remains because the developer, the builder, the property owner has to pay back the loan. And then we have the building proceeds here. So that's essentially the sale minus the debt retirement. Then they come up with the before tax cash flow with all the years and the last year it includes the sale of the building. And I also incorporate the equity into the calculation as well because it's relative to the equity. So this would be a discounted cash flow analysis based on a nine year sale for this office building. So I'm discounting it to now, to time zero. So that's we're looking at it, what is it worth today? And I'm using a 7% discount rate. The discount rate represents the opportunity cost and the risk associated with the investment. You can think of it, what would be a safe investment the developer could make as opposed to putting into this project? So I have this set up. Now the next step, we want to figure out what is the project, how is the project performing? How well is this doing? Okay. A lot of discussion about what's an appropriate return rate. I, you know, when I was in grad school, I would say 12 to 15 percent. I'm hearing now 10 to 15 percent because some people are saying the market's tightening a bit. But you know, just a 10 to 15 percent return is usually what developers are aiming for. Again, it depends on the individual developers. Some want more, some would be happier with a lower rate. But just to come up with a summary, 10 to 15 percent. And that is used as the basis for evaluating this investment relative to other opportunities. So the investor is saying, OK, I'm going to do the, invest the return rate, figure the return rate out. Does this deliver something that's comparable or better than what I can earn putting my money into a comparable investment or another investment? So that's what the, the return rate helps to identify. It also is a measure of risk and uncertainty. The higher the return rate or the higher the desired return rate, the larger, the higher the risk involved. Because right? developers want to be rewarded for the risk. They figure if they're taking a larger risk, they want a larger reward. So when developers go into new areas or are involved in different types of investments that they haven't been involved with before, or dealing with perhaps with resilience measures, maybe new and uncertain to them, they would 
likely say, well, we're looking at a bit of a higher return because this is new to us, this is a bit uncertain, there's a risk involved that we want to be compensated for.